Well, in legal usage, quid pro quo indicates that an item of service has been traded in return for something of value. For example, under common law, a binding contract must involve the exchange of something of value for something else of value. Similarly, political donors are legally entitled to support candidates that hold positions with which the donors agree or that will benefit the donors. The term may also be used to describe blackmail where a person offers to refrain from some harmful conduct in return for valuable consideration. Folks, we need to understand that seeking quid pro quo from God is a lack of trust in Him and is born out of spiritual immaturity. God is omnibenevolent. His way is the best way. And so our goal today is to understand how we can learn to trust God amidst whatever circumstances life throws at us and to stop promising our loyalty in exchange for his blessings. To better understand what I'm talking about, if you will turn with me to the book of Genesis. As we continue our study in Genesis, we're in chapter 28, if you can believe it, already. And I'll begin reading in verse 10 of chapter 28 in Genesis. Jacob left Beersheba and went toward Haran. And he came to a certain place, and he stayed there that night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed, and behold, there was a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give you and to your offspring. Your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in you, your offspring shall be all the families of the earth blessed. Behold, I am with you, and I will keep you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place! This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. So early in the morning, Jacob took the stone that he had put under his head and set it up for a pillar and poured oil on top of it. And he called the name of the place Bethel, but the name of the city was Luz at the first. Then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then... The Lord shall be my God, and this stone which I have set up for a pillar shall be God's house, and all of that you give me, I will give a full tenth to you. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Go back with me, if you will. Of course, we know this is uh, the, the story of the patriarchs. We've learned about Abraham. We've learned about Isaac. And now we're moving on to Jacob and looking at how the Lord deals and dealt with the patriarchs, uh, the beginning of the nation of Israel. And so here back in verse 10, we see Jacob is given this vision of angels ascending and descending heaven. Now, of course, this vision is affectionately known as Jacob's Ladder. Some people say that it is this portal between this world and, and the, the spiritual realm. But if we're remain, to remain true to the text, we really can't extrapolate such a thing as that. Because the text simply says that he saw this in, in a dream. Suffice to say that God reveals himself to Jacob this night for the very first time as the God of Jacob's father and his grandfather. Look at verse 13 with me now, if you will. So God repeats this promise of the Abrahamic covenant to Jacob, and he's identifying himself as Jacob's God. He says, I'm your God. Notice
notice that the verbiage there, look at it, it's very similar to the blessing that we heard from Isaac last week. So God gave that Abrahamic blessing to Isaac and now he's giving it to Jacob. So the, the passing of the mantle, if you will, is being passed on to Jacob now as the patriarch, the representative of God, God's mouthpiece to the people of Israel. Look at verse 16 with me now, if you will. Maybe you find it a little strange that even though Jacob is awestruck, I mean, who wouldn't be, right? You sing a vision of God. Notice that he vows to make the Lord his God. Look at what it says, if. It's a little word, but a big, a big meaning, right? How about you and me? Do we set conditions on God? Do we set conditions of our relationship on God? Jacob is asking for quid pro quo here, friends. He's saying, if you watch after me, if things go well for me, if you bring me back safely, then I will make you my God. Really? God already spoke it into being, friends. He already said, I'm your God. Jacob said, well, you know, if you do this, 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 and this for me, then I will, I will make you my God. Well, you see how ridiculous that sounds? I mean, you know, if, if you're like me, earlier, earlier in, your, in your study of, uh, of the Bible and in Sunday school, a lot of times when you read about some of these things with, with, with Israel, you just kind of shake your head and go, those Israelites, man, they just didn't get it, did they? But we do, right? We, we get it. You know, these, these Old Testament accountings of the patriarchs in Israel, we just sit in wonderment of, of them. But we're no different. Are we? I mean, really. We try and put stipulations on our relationship with God all the time. If we're being honest. I mean, we know He's all-powerful, so we try to tap into that power, right? You know, you see these prosperity gospel guys say, you know, be good and God will bless you, right? Try to tap into that power to our advantage. Demanding, yeah, demanding, right, that He fix our problem that we caused, right? And that he make our life easy and free of stress. Don't you get mad at God when he makes your life harder? I mean, you know he's all powerful. You know, you know he's sovereign over all things. And then these, these, these things come in your way and you're like, why are you doing this to me, Lord? You ever do that? I don't know, maybe I'm the only one, perhaps. And why doesn't he? Do this or that. I mean, when things get tough, we get mad and say things like, why are you doing this to me? Why are you letting this happen? Look at verse 18. Let's keep going. So he ends this episode with what seems on the outside as a fine gesture. But, but again, look at what he says. He says, I will give you 10% of all that you give me. <laughs> Not of all that I have, but just what, of what, he, what you give me. So in other words, it's kind of a backhanded promise, right? The more you give me, the more you're going to get. Interesting. Very interesting. So what's this telling us? What, what's this really about? I mean, friends, it's very clear. Jacob has no relationship with God yet. God is, he is meeting God for the first time, but Jacob does not have an intimate relationship with God yet. Not yet. His reactions, friends, are the reactions of an unbeliever to God. Look back at what he, what he says to Isaac when, when he tells him uh, why the game was, was found so quickly. If you go back to, uh, to chapter 27 uh, in verse 20, look at the way Jacob frames it up. Right? That Isaac said to his son, How is it you found it so quickly, my son? He answered, Because the Lord, your God, granted me success. Not the Lord, my God. Right? The Lord, your God. Because Jacob knows he's, 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 not, he's not quite there yet. He's, he's not in an intimate relationship with the God. This, this is the first encounter with God for Jacob. We're going to get to see him grow. Isn't it a blessing to look back? And to see where God's brought you. 
and you look at some of the circumstances, and maybe we can identify with, uh, with, with where Jacob was at this point in his relationship. And maybe you thought, man, I'm, I'm there, you know, I, I, I know God, I go to church, right? But we're going to get to see Jacob grow and develop and see God cultivate him into the person that he wants him to be. His reactions here demonstrate his immaturity. He's a baby. Have we ever reacted to God like that? I mean, some folks, you know, they, they never really do get to grow up in the Lord. And it is my prayer that that awakening occur with those folks. I've been there, friends. I've been there. You know, when I was, when I was nine years old, I was, I was raised Catholic until I was nine years old. And... When I was nine, uh, my dad was, was out mowing the grass one day, and uh, A. Lincoln Smith, Pastor Smith, uh, came canvassing through the neighborhood. And uh, my dad was out, out there, and, and he walks up, and he starts having a conversation with my dad. And my dad uh, goes inside and uh, went into the refrigerator and grabbed two beers and popped them open and brought them out. <laughs> and Pastor Smith was like, you go ahead. You know, and they sat there, on, yeah, and they sat there on the porch. Uh, you know, and, and they had this conversation, and Pastor Smith invited my dad to come to church. And he said, okay. Now, my mom, my mom was raised Baptist. I mean, she was Baptist since nine months before she was born. <laughs> and, and they'd been married, you know, at, at the time for, for almost 20 years. And my mother and my grandmother, you know, it's like you know, you, you're, you know, Timothy type thing. They were prayer warriors. I mean, just absolute prayer warriors and praying for salvation for my dad you know and so uh, we began we began going to church uh, over at this uh, church plant met in Rockledge Elementary School we sat in the, the elementary school chairs you know so your knees are like up high like that you're sitting in the chairs you know uh, enjoying church and so forth and, and, and three years later I was talking about this this morning with our guys when we were doing our mentoring three years later uh, Pastor Smith was, was preaching a sermon. He gave the invitation at the end, like, like Baptist pastors always do. And uh, I, it, it just clicked. It just clicked. And I said, that's true. That's true. I know it's true. And I turned to my dad and I said, Dad, we know this is true. We need to go, we need to go make this public. And so I grabbed his hand and we walked down and, and, uh, and made a public profession of faith. We were baptized together. It was, it was wonderful. And I mean, my dad, you know, he's, he's one of these guys where he's like all in. So, you know, go, go figure, you know, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. But, but dad, you know, every time the door swung open, we were there. We were there for business meetings. We were there for Wednesday night. We were there for training union. We were there for RAs. You know, I mean, everything. We're immersed in, in, and so forth. And, and so I, I grew up in, in that mentality of, you know, you're, you know, church doors are open. You're there. You're in church. And so we did that, you know, and as, you know, as, as Diana, when Diana and I got married and we, we moved away, I mean, we were always there out in church and we were serving and so forth, but it was not until this, this guy right here, this guy that's now taller than me, that I look up, you know, and try to pat him on the head if I can reach the top of his head, and, and his older brother, who's uh, on a layover now, uh, heading out to his new life and living in Atlanta, uh, were three months and, and three years old where uh, one of my mentors, Dr. Bob Horner, was uh, going through a series on the family. And, uh, you know, as he went through, you know, the, the Christian uh, family and the Christian child and the Christian mother and the Christian father and so forth, that Diane and I just looked at each other and we're like, man, that is, that is not us. That is not us. And then just this, this, this paradigm shift about why why we were doing what we were doing, just in both of us at the same time, you know, God just reached inside of us. And all I mean, we've been Christians for, for years at, at, at that time. So, I mean, it's just a, a shift of, of everything, of why you do everything that you do, you know. And, and so it's that, that maturity and that, that, that growth that He affects in you, you know. And, and so it's my prayer, friends, that, that every person ex experience that growth and that, that understanding of what it means to, uh, to really just be sold out, to be sold out. And I don't stand up here saying, look at me, look at me, because I didn't do it. 
I mean, he did it. He just reached inside of me and just flipped some kind of a switch, and, and, and there it was. So praise God for what he did that I, that I couldn't do, because I can tell you, you know, if it, if it were me doing it, then it'd be all about Doug, because for many, many years it was all about Doug. So don't, don't think I'm standing up here saying, look at me, look at me. I'm saying, look at God, look at God, what he can do. What he can do with this selfish egomaniac here, he can do much more with you. Much more. So, this is God's first encounter with Jacob. We're talking about maturity and growth. But you know, I mean, if we're being honest, you know, we sit here, here it's, a, it's Sunday morning, and we're, we're, we're getting up, we're, we're getting the family ready, and we're, we're coming to church and so forth, but when you look at our lives, I mean, if we go around the room here, we start talking about the things that are going on with each of us. It's a stressful life. It is. You know, with, 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 with work and, and the economy and, and, and with, with things that are going on in the world and in, in, in this country and things that are happening just, you know, in our, our very family, it's a very stressful life, isn't it? Why? I mean, is it because we're just not being good enough Christians? No. No. It's because, you see, friends, God is, is, is developing us and shaping us through the events of life in a growth pattern that He's designed. You know, and, and sometimes, you know, if we're, if, if we're that baby Christian, we get the idea that, you know, well, well once, I'm, once I'm a Christian... And once I begin to, to do what God's asking me to do, and once I start behaving right, once I start reading my Bible and I start sinning less, then God's going to take care of all of my problems and everything's going to be well. And if they, if they aren't, you know, then, then maybe you have people in your life who, who have a lack of understanding of God, a lack of understanding of what this is all about. Like Job's friends who said, oh, you must have done something wrong. You know, the only reason that, that your life is, is so hard, the only reason you're struggling so much is because you must, you must be sinning. You must, is there a recurring sin that you're, that you're not confessing? Is there some, you know, are you, are you not doing what you're supposed to do? Are you not tithing? You know, are you not serving? No, friends, it's not that. It's not that. This, not, this life is not a bed of roses. Next one is, next one is, but this is the shaping, you see. So God is not a God of quid pro quo. He's not a vending machine where, you know, you put your, your, your money in and you press A17 and you get your corn chips. He's not like that. But he is omnibenevolent, meaning his way is the best way. And he is mapping out exactly what is supposed to happen so that the perfect outcome, end game, occurs, and that you and I are prepared for it. Everything that's happening to you, good, bad, or indifferent, however you view it, is designed to do that very thing, to shape you. He's shaping us, friends. So what's our takeaway? I think you know. How do we grow? Well, good news, you are. What is it that's going to help us avoid looking to God and asking for quid pro quo? Well, I want to encourage us to consider understanding and practicing the spiritual disciplines. And I want to talk about one specifically this morning. One that most of us, present company included, are not as familiar with as we probably should be. It's the spiritual discipline of simplicity. Simplicity. Now, immediately when you hear that word, we in Americans leap to a conclusion about what simplicity is. I want to talk about what it is, but I want to also talk about what it is not. Okay. When we hear that, we think that we have to, we have to shave our head, sell our possessions, and sleep on a cot. That's not simplicity. That's not the spiritual discipline of simplicity, not in any way. Um, when I was teaching a class on the, on the spiritual disciplines, one of the books that I use is uh, by Richard Foster. It's Celebration of Discipline. Maybe you've heard of it. 
And he talks about this discipline. He, de he describes it this way. He describes it as simplicity is freedom. Duplicity is bondage. Simplicity brings joy and balance. Duplicity brings anxiety and fear. Do you see the comparison contrast? When, when, we, when we're thinking about something that's duplicitous, what does that mean? That means that there, there is more than one, right? So if we're, a dog cannot chase two rabbits. My, my, my karate sensei told me that a long time ago. Dog cannot chase two rabbits. You're not going to catch either one, right? So, so what are we talking about? A singleness of purpose. A singleness of purpose in why we do what we do. The duplicity of worshiping self, the duplicity of worshiping pleasure and, and peace. You know, we seek the, the, the pleasure and the peace and the success and that good feeling in all of the wrong places when all of them rest with one thing. And that's keeping the main thing the main thing. The spiritual discipline of simplicity is being content in all circumstances. Being content in all circumstances. It's a tall order. Simplicity sets us free to receive the provision of God as a gift that is not ours to keep. And it can be freely shared with others. And so here's my challenge for us today. In our daily quiet time, I want to challenge us to read out of the book of Philippians. And I think you know where I'm going. Chapter 4. Verse 10 through 13 says this. Paul writes, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have received your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I'm speaking of being in need. For I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low. And I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Changes the understanding, the perspective of that passage when you add to it the, 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 the text before it. Because, of course, context is king. Context is king. What's the context is? Having a lot, having a little. Being in need, having plenty, and so forth. And once he says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, what he's referring to is, no matter what the circumstances throw at me, I'm going to be content because I have Christ. And the truth of it is, friends, if our entire life here on this earth is just really perceived by all, including ourselves, as just really crappy, and we're regenerated beings who will spend eternity with the Lord, that's a bountiful blessing that's immeasurable. Immeasurable. The joy of the Lord is our strength. And so, this week, during your daily quiet time, I want to challenge you to read through Philippians 4, 10 through 13, and bring into your heart what it means to be truly content with whatever the Lord decides to throw at you. Will you do it? Let's pray.